What's up, PTB Nation? Welcome to another episode of the Park in the Bus podcast here on the PTB Media Network. And we are debuting a brand new format tonight. This is now a two man show, no longer a solo. Um, yeah, most- baby. <laughs> you hear him in the background. That's right. You hear Leo Kukakis, DGensUnited.com. He is my co host, not my guest anymore, but now my co host here on. Park in the bus. This was a hit segment, and we decided that this should be the show. So, Leo, welcome aboard. Welcome to the Park in the Bus. Uh, That's right, baby. Kukaki and the Capitano taking over YouTube, taking over your podcast, baby. Who's ready to bitch about some soccer tonight? That's right. You mentioned YouTube. Hell, shout out to everybody watching on YouTube. I need you guys right now to go down there and hit the subscribe button at the bottom of your screen. Right next to the subscribe button, there's a little bell. Click on that bell so you get an alert every time PTB Media Network puts out another video. All right. And we got a lot to cover tonight, Leo. We got a lot of footy to talk. Um, yes, sir, we do. I'm going to start us off, okay, on the weekend with – I'm just going to rattle off some results from a Brazilian league, Brasileiro, all right, from this past weekend. And if you bear with me for one moment, I will update everybody on – the results, they got started on Saturday. Red Bull Bragantino 4, Sierra 2, Fortaleza 1, Internacional, Porto Alegre 0, Atlético Goianense 3, Atlético uh, Mineiro 4. On Sunday, Curitiba 1, Vasco da Gama 0, Grêmio 1, Palmeiras 0, Botafogo 0, Santos 0, Sport Recife 1, Fluminense 0. And moving forward, we had Wednesday, September the 23rd, Sports Recife 1, Corinthians 0. Last Saturday now, we're up to, we're up to speed. Atlético Paranaense 1, Bahia 0, Inter Porto Alegre 1, São Paulo 1, uh, Atlético Mineiro 3, Grêmio 1, Vasco da Gama 1, Red Bull Bragantino 1, Palmeiras 1, Flamengo 1, Atlético Goianense 1, Botafogo 1, Sierra 2. Goiás, two, and Santos, one, Fortaleza, one, the last match of the round, Fluminense, four, Curitiba, nil. Let's look at the table real quick. Atlético Mineiro, top of the table on 24 points from 11 matches. Inter, Porto Alegre, are second on 21, three back, followed by Sao Paulo and Palmeiras with 19. Vasco da Gama is fifth, along with Flamengo. They got 18 and then in the Copa Sudamericana spots from 7 to 12, you got Fluminense, Sport Recife, Santos, uh, Fortaleza, Atletic Paranaense, and Serra. And then rounding out the table, we got that middle group there that's neither going to Comune Ball nor in the relegation zone. It is Atletic Goianense, th- 13 points, same as Gremio. Corinthians all the way down in 15th. Corinthians, Leo, our buddy Pepito's team. Pepito! <laughs> all the way down in 15th place right now. Only three wins from 11 matches. Tough times oh. for, for such a large club. Curitiba, 16th, also on 11 points. Red Bull Bragantino in the first relegation spot in 17th. Botafogo right below him in 18th. Goyas in 19th. And Bahia dead last in, um, in 20th place with nine points. All right, so that wraps that up. Let's move to England now, Leo. And I know you paid some special attention to England. A lot to talk about in the Premier League, especially about one certain club, wouldn't you say? Yeah, man, a ton to go over. Um, you know, if you want to go over it, you're in the mood for results first, you want me to yell about Manchester City first. Yeah, let's, yeah. Let, let's run over results. You got them there or you want me to read them? I just pulled them up right here. So let's start off with the big result of the weekend. Um, actually, no, we'll start off on Saturday. Saturday, absolutely insane game. Brighton, Manchester United. Brighton hit the post five times. It was unbelievable to watch. This is coming from somebody that had Brighton plus a half a goal. Um, unbelievable. They score a goal in the 95th minute. There's only supposed to be five minutes of stoppage time. Um, felt good. It's 2-2. You know, the game's pretty much over, right? Wrong. The referee doesn't see that the ball goes over the line. Should have been a goal kick. Ref clearly misses the call. Calls it a corner kick. On the resulting corner kick, you get a stupid handball from Brighton. Bruno Fernandes uh, steps up, buries a penalty in the 100th minute. 3-2 3-2 Manchester United. They, they stole it. They, it was terrible. It was embarrassing. That ref should be ashamed of himself. Um, but 
Then we move on. Everton and Carlo Ancelotti pick up another three points. 2-1 over uh, Crystal Palace. Chelsea come back from 3-0 down against West Brom to tie it up 3-3 in the dying embers of the game. Then Southampton gets a big win over Burnley 1-0. Leeds show up Sunday morning and beat Sheffield United in Sheffield 1-0. Then um, Jose Mourinho's this game uh, Tottenham. Was <laughs> Go ahead. No, Mourinho's, Mourinho's Tottenham give up a penalty in the last minute of the game. 1-1 to Newcastle. Then my Manchester City, baby. That's what I'm talking about. They take an absolute beatdown. A curb stop at the hand of Leicester City. Three penalty kicks in one game. Thumbs up defense. Excellent. And you know, I'm going to cut you off there. Since I talked about this real early this morning, I put out the, the UFC review. That looked like Paulo Costa and Israel Adesanya. Jesus, man. What are you doing? <laughs> um, by the way, speaking of that, did you see Paulo Costa's um, response to what happened during the fight? I haven't. I've been looking everywhere for, for oh, something from him. Did he have an excuse for why he forgot to fight? No, he um <laughs> he had some words about the little uh the little papa pupa. Well, did Asian you see what he did in the corner? It was even no, worse. There, no, uh, I, I Google it. it after. See what Adesanya did after he went over to to Costa's corner. The the poor guys are trying to sh- are, are extending him like a handshake, and then you should see the gesture he did. <laughs> oh, that's not good. That is not good. <laughs> All right, we'll we'll save that for another review show. Of but, course. Um, yeah, Manchester City get curb stomp five two at Leicester. West Ham show up and they stomp the Portuguese minor national. <laughs> yeah, no <goal>. kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was for nothing. That was an absolute beatdown. Then Aston Villa show up. They dismantle Fulham 3 0. And then the final game on the big Monday one. Liverpool 3 1 over Arsenal in a dominant performance from Liverpool. Where where do you start on this, man? There, there's so many good talking points. Let's let's go to the table real quick since we we're three rounds in. We are teams are already starting to separate themselves. So you got in the top three. You got Leicester, Liverpool, and Everton on nine points. Aston Villa are fourth. If the league ended today, they'd go into the Champions League. <laughs> <laughs> They're on six points. They're ahead of everybody else with six points on goal difference. Uh, Arsenal, Crystal Palace, and Leeds also on six points. Good start for Crystal Palace and Leeds, certainly. Jose Mourinho's Tottenham after that that last minute penalty kick. That ironically, even even Steve Bruce, the manager of Newcastle, said that's not a penalty kick. <laughs> hey, that's you know we should really put in a video review system, you know, for them to correct these kind of calls. <laughs> so. so. I can't, I can't come on here and say that that's not – because I have – since video has been put in, I have said if a ball hits your hand, it's a penalty. It's not the way the game used to be called. But once you look at things on video, that's, you know – so I, I live with that. But uh, it, I don't think the English ne- especially agree with me. I think they're more hesitant and more resistant to, to VAR. And, um, yeah, it, they drop they drop two points and, and drop out of that six point group, but they're they lead up the four point group along with Chelsea, Newcastle, and Newcastle, uh, eighth, ninth, and tenth respectively. Then West Ham in eleventh with three, Brighton twelfth, your boys Man City thirteenth on three points, but only two matches played. United are there as well, same goal uh, goal difference, same points, three points minus one goal difference. Then it's Southampton, Wolves, and West Brom bringing out the other spots. And then in the relegation zone is the three teams yet to get any points, Burnley, Sheffield United, and Fulham. Let's go to Man City then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, let's go ahead. Let's talk about it. We Big suck. Big news. You know, you and I kind of ha- are uh, <laughs> the perfect, I think, people to talk about the, this, this little transfer that went down after the game. This is the first time in I think four or five, maybe even six years, I look at a Manchester City deal and say, wow, we got a bargain. That never happens. Ruben Diaz, 40 million, so 40 million euros, net, and they yeah, tree stump. Yeah, a net, a net of, but City are paying two thirds of Otamendi's salary while he's at Benfica. Still, it's absolutely an amazing ridiculous. deal, I think, for both sides. <laughs> Otamendi sucks. You guys are gonna hate him. I don't. Oh. I disagree. I disagree. He's he knows our league. He fights. We need fight, and fight? we don't need him to defend. Who fights? Otamendi. 
Then why are you signing a center back if you don't need a defender? We need a def- we need a guy that is hard nosed. <laughs> we play out of the back. He's gonna be fine. Plus, who? <laughs> Tell me this. Who are we gonna go find better than him? I'm so happy that we're recording this so we can we can revisit this in a Listen, couple Listen, I've been months. fighting with my own fans about this because they can't get past, past the fact that he played for somebody else 6 years ago. All right. He's already uh, he's already said he's he's here to play for this team. He's said all the right things. He's a professional. He's been at Valencia, he's been at Manchester City, he's won the Europa League, he's been in two finals of the Copa America, he's been in two champ uh two World Cup finals. He Put him with Vertonghen, and I, we are all set. He's not as good as Ruben, but we weren't going to keep him. But to think that we got somebody back that can – he is much better than our other options, okay? <laughs> he is much better than our – up until last year, he was still a first-choice player. He's missed a total – people are saying he's old and he's injured. No, Nico Otamendi has missed a total of 11 minutes in his entire professional career on injury. 11 days, excuse me, in his entire professional career. He is not injury prone. He's 32 years old. In center back years, he's, he's still in his prime. If he starts to play and he finds the form, he's easily going to be very good for our league going forward. I think we're going to be – I think both teams made out well because, like you said, you got a good deal for Ruben Dias. And um, because you had a player to send the other way, it was a net transfer of, of 40-odd million. Uh, FIFA fan, Financial Fair Play is going to be happy with this because the – the books are balanced with this deal. That was the real, the real, um, that was the real the reason, reason that we threw it out the Mendy. Yeah. The, the reason for the deal was that exactly. It was FIFA financial fair play. We didn't make the champions league. We had to sell somebody. He's the only guy that we're going to sell. That's got real value right now. And we needed to replace him. The deal makes complete sense. Yeah. I mean, I, I completely agree with you. I, it kind of sounds like I'm speaking out of both sides of my mouth. <laughs> you guys are going to enjoy it. That being said for my end, Boy, did he look like a tree stump the last couple of years. It's yeah, everybody sure. that says that he's injury prone, that that's not true. No, he he just he wasn't good enough to play at Manchester City. Benfica Anymore. a little bit of a smaller club. Yeah, he was yeah, at yeah. A, he was at another time. And Man City have upgraded in the position. Let's be let's be fair. Yeah, baby, I'm pumped. I love Ruben Dias. I love he's he's a young guy. He's one of those guys that. He can kind of sort of grow into that Vincent Company role. He can learn. He can mm-hmm. develop here. Um, he can really become – oh, man, it just it's a fantastic deal. He was the one center back I was really pulling for. Enough of this Nathan Ake nonsense, you suck no. bag. You know, Ru- Ruben is – Go back to Bournemouth. Is, listen, Ruben is, is a perfect fit for the Premier League. He's got – he's hard-nosed. He's, he's fast. He's got a nice long diagonal ball. Um, I think Pep is going to – he's going to enjoy playing under him. Okay, he can yep. go forward when he needs to. He's a threat. He scored a goal for us in his final match this weekend. Okay, he got forward on a corner. He's dangerous on set pieces. He defends. Obviously, he defends well. He's a he's Portugal's center back. He's the future captain. He's going to take the armband from Cristiano Ronaldo when Cristiano Ronaldo steps down, I'm pretty sure. He's got yeah. leadership qualities. This guy, and he gave an interview. He speaks immaculate English already. So, <laughs> I mean, what there will be no no – that part of the transition is not even going to be an issue because he speaks English perfectly fine. And I think he's going to handle the transition to England very well, just as, as Bruno Fernandes did across town at Manchester United. He handled that, that transition like a you know, snap yeah. of a finger. And I think he's a guy, Ruben Diaz, that could be in a Man City sky blue uniform for a long, long time. Like you said, he could be your next Vincent company. He could develop into that captain, into that leader. He's got all the qualities. Um, 12 years at Benfica since he was just a kid. He's 23. He was 11 when he came into the club. Always the captain at every age group all the way up. So, And then he leaves Benfica on the final day, finally, as captain. They gave him the captain's armband for his final game, which basically sealed the deal for anybody watching if they had any doubt that the deal was going to happen. When a 23-year-old takes the, takes the pitch with the captain's armband, you know he's leaving. <laughs> I mean, just a fantastic deal. But you know what? Manchester City were desperate for it. I still don't think that this is enough for Manchester City. This team looks bad. They look old. Uh, they're bringing in young kids that are clearly not developed enough. Mm-hmm. Pep looks Pep looks somewhat defeated. Like it doesn't out of ideas almost, right? Yeah, yeah. And this is not the Manchester City team that. Uh, I mean, I made it clear. Once Sané left. You, you need a whole new, whole new kind of mindset because well, yeah. him and Sterling were the engines that made that mm-hmm. team go. 
He did not get nearly the credit. I just want to run through the lineup real quick. Yeah, go for it. I mean, it looks like a pretty decent lineup, but if you look at the back, um, the back four and then the two guys in front of him, you got Mendy. Nathan Ake sucks. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care how much we pay for him. He is an absolute atrocity. Mm-hmm. You got Eric Garcia, who doesn't care anymore. He, he wants to go to Barcelona. He's mentally checked out of Manchester City. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have Kyle Walker, who's one of the dumbest players in the <laughs> league. He's a special kind of stupid, special kind of athletic, but there is no brain in that big round head of his. There is nothing there. Then you got Fernandinho, who's now going back to his natural position as a defensive mid, mm-hmm. but he played center back all year. Yeah. So it's not going to be a transition for him. And then you start Rodri next to him. These guys haven't played with each other at all. Yeah. So, I mean, it's difficult when you're starting two young guys back there. Then you have Rodri and Ferdinandinho never playing together in front of them. Uh, Ferdinandinho basically readjusting to a brand new position. Rodri is just, he hasn't really played that well. He hasn't really impressed me. He strikes me more of a center back than he does a defensive mid. And then moving up top, here we go again. This is a, what, $2 billion roster? And we can't, we don't have a striker on the field because Aguero's hurt? I, I mean, what, what is this nonsense? I mean, it's just, it's mind-blowing that a team of this stature can come into a game and not have a striker on the field. And I understand, oh, the false number nine and this. No, no. The times that we are yeah. most successful, Kun Aguero's on the field. I understand there's not going to be another Kun Aguero. I love that guy with all my heart. That being said, there needs to be a damn striker on the field. This is getting to be ridiculous. Manchester City, this is officially becoming a circus. And let's look real quick at the guys that came in off the bench. D, uh, the guys on the bench, I should say. d who are you? Okay. Fernando Torres. <laughs> who are you? Fernando Torres is going to be a superstar. I love that kid. Mm-hmm. He needs to get more run. We need to stop the nonsense with Aladdin and put Fernando Torres in. Um, Laporte was obviously injured. Zach Steffen, big fan of his. Um, He'll never, he'll never be the number one, though. No, absolutely not. But he got a good start today. That was pretty yeah. impressive. Um, and then Zinchenko. I mean, not even a hint. There's not even a striker on the bench. Yeah, your injury list is quite long. I'm, I'm going to read your injury list right now. And Bernardo Silva's back. But in this, in this match, he was injured. Gabriel Jesus, uh, Gundogan, Juan Cancelo, John Stones, Kun Aguero. That's almost a team in itself right there that is on the injured reserve right now. Just extremely frustrating. Like I said, man, Manchester City, we are a, we are a powerhouse of a team. And this team that we have out there, I honestly it wouldn't shock me if we don't qualify for Champions League. If there, if there aren't any type of adjustments made, yeah, it wouldn't shock me if Everton finished ahead of us. Obviously, Liverpool is going to win the league. We have no chance. We proved that the other day. Um, you know, Manchester United. Now they got Usman Dembele for $75 million. I can see that. Yeah, that's a lot a of money for a team that's still going to be in the Europa League next year. I don't know. Wouldn't shock me if they make a run up against us. Uh, you know, Tottenham still have plenty of talent. They have Mourinho. If Mourinho can just figure a way to just stop talking and start coaching more, they'll be all right. And like I said, everything's that team that I look at. And every time I watch them, I say, oh, boy. Oh, but boy. Ancelotti's got something wanna, going here. You want to switch gears and go to Everton for a minute then? Let's do it, baby. You really think they're going to hang on to this, or you think they're going to be just a splash in the pan for the first couple of months of the season? I do, and I genuinely believe that if if they can avoid injuries, which is kind of the thing with every team, this team is – there is not a hole on this team. Um, I mean, just looking from the lineup from this weekend, you got Jordan yep. Pickford in net. I love Jordan Pickford. I know that he struggled at times over the last year mm-hmm. or two. He's a world-class goalie in my opinion. Then on the right side, you have Seamus Coleman, who started. Uh, you have Yerimina. Uh, you got Michael Keane. Um, you got Luka Dinier. Dinia. Yep, Lucas Dinia. And then in the midfield, you start Dukure, Allen, Andre Gomes. Uh, really good, really good um, defensive midfield right there. Mm-hmm. And then, and then the a good attack. You can play up top, you got James Rodriguez, who's been absolutely stellar through the first few mm-hmm. games. You got Calvert-Lewin. You got Moise Keane. You got Richarlison, who's been an absolute animal. Yep. You have other guys that can come in and rotate in, like uh, Tom Davies, Alex Awobi, Moise Keane, uh, Sigurdsson. Yep. yep. 
I mean, this is a team that is built to kind of sort of make a run. And, oh, by the way, they have that world-class manager in um, Carlo Ancelotti on there. I, I love I really, Carlo Ancelotti. I'm a big fan of his. Me too. I, I love how his old school stuff. And he's I do. Just, he's just one of the best managers that nobody talks about. And I'm looking yeah. at everything this year and saying, yeah, yeah, they're going to make the top four. You know, you know, the old school stuff, that's, there's still a place for it. It's not at Barcelona or at even Manchester City or, or Liverpool, but a club like Everton is a perfect place to bring that attitude. They got a workmanlike team. They got some world class players we just named off Rich Allison, um, James Rodriguez, you know, Moise Akin. They got some world class players there. And, but they still, they all know how to work. And when a team can work, you know, they can make up for any, any disparity in talent. But that's a very, very talented team for, for an Everton. A team that, you know, a lot of times is in the 12th to 16th range, staying safely away from relegation, but nowhere near the Europa League, kind of in that middle ground of the table. Yeah. You know, and um, I think they can make an ascent into the Europe, you know, to at least compete for the European spots this year. Yeah, I mean, I think they're going to be really good. And then the other team I've been high on so far is Arsenal. And part of it is just because of my obsession with Mikel Arteta and Pierre Aubameyang. They kind of took a step back for me the way that they – it wasn't even a game against Liverpool. I know mm-hmm. they went up on nothing. They did not play well in that game. They did not look good in that game at any mm-hmm. point. Kind of sort of took a step back for me. Um, but, I mean, yeah, I definitely look at those two teams and say, yeah, you know, they can, they can get top four. Wouldn't shock me if Manchester City's playing in the Europa League next year. You have more, more uh, confidence in Arsenal than I do. I don't see them at that level. I think they can play nice football, and they can beat the teams below them when the pressure comes and it's time to play a big match. We saw Monday what happens to them against uh, a quality opponent. Um, <laughs> tough times right now for Wolverhampton as well. Wolverhampton uh, Wanderers continuing to lose points. One, one victory so far from three matches. Um, what have you seen from Wolves? Have you caught them at all? I've caught a little bit of it, and it just kind of feels like they overachieved last year. Um, you know, and I really do think that the, the loss of Diogo Yota is a That's huge, gonna huge hurt. loss for them. Yep. Um, Neto, he's not bad. Bondens, not bad. But in reality, they're not going to be able to replace Diogo Yota. That guy had some magic in his feet. Um, I don't see them finishing top eight this year. I think they'll be middle of the table somewhere between nine and 12 in that range. Um, kind of playing those pointless the last couple months of the year. I don't really see it out of them right now. And if that happens, they're going to have a hard time keeping some of these players. Mm-hmm. There's no European football say. next season at the Mall and you. You can say bye-bye to Traore. You can say bye-bye to Jimenez if he gets to the end of the season, if he's not sold either in this window or in the next. When, when does the window close? I believe it's October 5th. I don't know. England likes to okay. do their own date earlier, so maybe sooner. But I'm pretty sure it's October the 5th, which is, what, Friday? Yeah, yeah. So, very, very interesting to see who's going to stay, who's going to go. A yeah. uh, ton of rumors, obviously, floating around right now. Um, by the way, shout out to Leeds. Those, those boys are looking I pretty was good. Just, that's just where I was going to go next. Um, a team both of us have been high on since last season, Leeds United. Uh, two victories from three matches, and their only loss was to Liverpool, who they played right to the end. And, um, yeah, they, they're they like the 2018-2019 the Wolves here in 2020. Yeah, I mean, they look good. They're sneaking on some wins. I don't think they're going to be able to uh, compete for European football next year, but they look pretty good. They look like they're starting to build something. It's nice to see with the leads, the, you know, uh, with all their storied history, it's good mm-hmm. to see them coming out, coming back out of nowhere. Here's okay, so here's Leeds. They got to test them. Here's the month of October for Leeds since we're talking Leeds. Okay, they start this Saturday home to your boys, to Man City. Then there's the international break after that, and they're back on the 17th home to Wolves. So we'll see how they match up with you. Got two teams going in opposite directions. Be interesting to see how they match up there when they meet. Then they travel to Aston Villa on the 24th, come back home to host Leicester City on the 31st tough month of October for Leeds. It'll be a real test. Let's see where they are in a month. Yeah, I mean, it's like you said, it's going to be a real tough test. We're going to see what they're made of. Um, it's going to be one of those months where you kind of hope to just tread water and see what happens. I think if they get six points from these four matches, they'll be sitting on 12 points. They'll be pretty happy um, on the last day of, of October if, yep. they've, if they get six points out of these four matches. Completely agree. All right, so at the other end of the table, Leo, we got we – got, 
a team we talked about them last year too because we we talked pretty extensively about the championship they were the playoff winners i always say that is the favorite to go right back down fulham uh you know one they did win a match they have a win here but um Losing 4-3 to two leads, losing 3-0 here to Aston Villa. Where do you see Fulham in a month's time? You know, I looked at Fulham and I said, these boys are, they're a real good team. I like, I, I have an infatuation with Mitrovic. Anybody that's been listening to us since, you know, since uh, back when we started this, you guys know how I feel about Mitrovic. This Fulham team does not look good. Um, yeah. I like Ariola and Net. I like some of the attacking people that they have coming forward, uh, namely Reed, but and obviously Mitrovic too. They still have Tom Kearney, but um, this is a crucial, crucial next few weeks coming up for them. They're going to have Wolves, which we already talked about on the road. They're going to have Sheffield United on the road in a couple of weeks. Then they're going to host Crystal Palace, West Brom, and then go on the road to uh, West Ham. These next five games could dictate whether or not they're even in a race to, to stay, stay up. up, yeah, I mean, and really, I misspoke. If, I I gave them credit for these two wins they have here are in the league cup. They in the league they have a tough tough opening schedule. Let's be honest. They lose three nil to Arsenal. They lose four three to Leeds, and then three nil again to Aston Villa. But but um, yeah, I mean, the next it, month is gonna be is gonna be crucial to even put them in a place to fight for a a spot to stay up. And it's really sad because they look disinterested. And it, it always amazes me. You guys fight so hard. You guys got stuck in the championship for a couple, um, for a couple of years. You guys know how hard it is to come back. And now they look disinterested. It might be time for a coaching change. Uh, the coach just doesn't seem to have their ear right now. They look like a mess. They need something. Yeah, and, you know, there's, te- there's I think of three clubs when I think of this situation. I think of Fulham. I think of Norwich City and I think of West Brom. They just yo-yo up and down all the time. Yeah. And they take those parachute payments that you get when you get relegated. The, the, the Premier League is very nice to the teams they relegate. They send them down with a ton of money. They build a <laughs> roster and they come right back up. Um, mm-hmm. And I think Fulham have figured that out on the business sense. So they don't spend that much when they get up. They they know that if they get relegated, they got this parachute pay, payment. They know they can build what it takes to build a team in the championship to get themselves back up. Like you said, it took a couple tries this time. It wasn't right away like it was for, say, Norwich uh, two seasons ago or West Brom last season. But, I mean, I these clubs are kind of stuck in this thing where your fans, you're driving your fans through the – through the mud, literally, but you're, <laughs> you know, you're, you're fighting for your life and it, it seems like the end of the world. And then the next year you can't be stopped in the championship and you climb and you get promoted and you got all this aspirations that this time we're going to stay up. We're going to move up the table. We're going to push for top 10. And then you come back and the cycle just <laughs> continues to repeat itself. It's, it, it, you can't imagine that it's very fun. It, it does not sound like a great time. All right. You want to move to Germany? Yeah, man, we got big results in Germany. We do have big uh, results in Germany. Do you have them up? I'll pull them up if not. I got, I got them up right now, man. Right. We started the weekend off on Friday. Eintracht Frankfurt, one of our picks. We got them at a pick over Hertha Berlin. It was an absolute massacre. 3-1, brilliant performance from Frankfurt. Then on Saturday, you got Stuttgart 4-1 over Mainz. Both teams finished the game with 10 men. Then you had a big one between Bayer Leverkusen and RB Leipzig that finishes 1-1. München Gladbach, Union Berlin, 1-1. Uh, Augsburg, stun Borussia Dortmund, mm-hmm. 2-0. Uh, that was a stunning um, result. And then you got Armenia, Bielefeld over uh, Köln. Uh, Werder Bremen go on the road. They beat 10 men Schalke, 3-1. Um, then you had Freiburg, Wolfsburg, 1-1. And then the stunner of all stunners, Hoffenheim, take Bayern Munich to the woodshed. 4-1, absolute massacre, stunning weekend in the Bundesliga. Yeah, Bayern Munich were fresh off their win in the European Super Cup also. I think they extended a lot of, or expended, excuse me, a lot of uh, energy in that in that cup game going to extra time. And um, looking at it here, you know, here's their 11. It's not, doesn't look like there's all that much wrong with it. There's a few changes you could make, but... But Bayern Munich come out with Manuel Neuer, Benjamin Pavard, Jerome Boateng, David Alaba, and Alfonso Davies. 
Corentin Tol- Toliso and Joshua Kimmich in the hole with uh, Thomas Mueller leading the, the attacking midfielders partnered by Serge Gnabry and Leroy Sané. And Joshua Zerke gets the start in, in the Robert Lewandowski spot. Um, but you can't, that can't be the reason that they gave up four goals. Um, perhaps they underestimated this Hoffenheim team. Yeah, but I think it's just kind of Boateng and Alaba. They they don't work well together. I don't think they worked very well together last year. They just happened to have a weak second part of the schedule, and they uh, they kind of took care of business from there. I I don't think that Boateng and Alaba are a very good tandem. I still think that you need to find a way to get Nicolas Sula back in there, uh, probably for Boateng. They will find a way. It's called Boateng is going to get injured one every three games. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's just a matter of time. You know, not a. It's an annoying loss for Bayern Munich, but I mm-hmm. mean, it, in the grand scheme of things, it's Bayern Munich. Yeah, they, they've fallen behind by 10 points this stage in the season before and then won by 10 points. So yeah, I don't think anybody exactly, is, is panicking. And not a huge, huge result either, considering the fact that Dortmund forget to show up against Augsburg. They end up losing 2 0. Well, they um, always do that. Every time they have a chance to, to, you know, get away from Bayern and to really contend, they make sure to help out their rivals by dropping points <laughs> as well. Yeah, I mean, it was just a brutal game for uh, Borussia Dortmund. I really expected big things from them this year. Uh, again, they go in with the young kids. No surprise there. Uh, young kids, when you play this many of them, this is, this is going to happen. happen. Yeah. So, I mean, you kind of got to take the good with the bad. Again, good performance from Bellingham the other day. Uh, 17-year-old, really, really quality player. He looks like he's going to really thrive in this, um, in this setup. On this team, yep. Uh, Hollins, we all know what we're going to get from him. Jaden Sancho, interesting next week. We're, we're, what's going to happen with Sancho? Is he you scoring? know, and I think players don't typically play well when they're, in, when they're in this limbo as to where their future lies. This is something that happens a lot. Players, um, you know, transfer rumors start, and then they fall apart, and then another team comes into the picture, and that falls apart. And I think Jaden Sancho is kind of getting caught there where he's trying to focus on Dortmund, but he doesn't know where his next paycheck's coming from. He could be on a plane tomorrow to England, you know, and he could be at, you know, any host of teams. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's a tough position. And again, he's so young that he doesn't know how to deal with it. And it's not his fault. No, not he's at all. He's just that young. And, you know, it's a very, very difficult thing to deal with. You know, I, I guess this is a good spot to talk about. I'm not a big fan. This is one thing I don't like about the transfer window. I don't like – in England tried to correct this in the Premier League, and it did, the coaches didn't like it, and I think they've moved away from it as well. I don't like the transfers once the season has started until you get to January. This month for, of – normally it's August. This year we played it here in September. But this first three, four games of the season where you're, the transfer window is still open and you don't know what players are going to leave, you don't know what players are going to come in, very hard to get your team ready to, to, to go after a championship. Points get dropped. And then you're playing catch up once the window closes. And that's the best case scenario. You have. Other and that's scenarios. the best case scenario. You you have other scenarios like uh, Leroy Sané last year. You know he was on the plane ready to go to Bayern Munich, and then Pep's like, "No, nah, that's cool, man. We're gonna play you in the Community Shield." Dude tears his ACL and it's yeah. done for a year. Exactly. Um, and it ended up costing us an extra. I think it was thirty million because we had a seventy-two million dollar deal. We mm-hmm. only sold him for forty-five. So, I mean, kind of, kind of, sort of, that's what we get. But, um, yeah, I mean, really, really tough. And, again, something that gets lost is that we're talking about young kids. And even the older guys, they're 30 years old. I mean, it's not, it's not like you're built for this kind of stuff. But guys right. like Jaden Sancho that are 20 years old, how the hell are you supposed to deal with this, man? Yeah. How you got to be well advised. And, it all, you know, this is, where the, this is why the agents make so much money. Because they have to handle this for you. They have to keep the player focused. It's one, probably the hardest part of their job. It's harder than brokering deals, I think, in my, in my opinion, is keeping your player focused because that player is an asset to you. And if his performance starts to dip with transfer rumors, that value spikes. That value starts to dive real quickly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just it's, – it's really interesting to see how some players can handle it, other players can't handle it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that was the Bundesliga this weekend. Um, I hate that we can't really get into Bundesliga because we all know what the hell's coming. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, it's other, really hard to get excited stories about. stories haven't developed yet. We don't know who's going to chase for second, third, and fourth. We don't know who's going to go into the relegation battle yet. Um, this league is very good at those secondary stories. It's been carrying the league since Bayern's dominance started. 
what, eight right. years ago? And um, there's usually a surprise story every season. There's somebody that comes out of nowhere that goes near the top, you know. We've had Hoffenheim in the past. We've had uh, Eintracht in the past. RB Leipzig, you know, they had a quick ascend into that upper echelon. And uh, we'll see who it's going to be this year. It could be. You got any hunches? Not yet. Not yet. Too soon to tell for me. Um, but, I mean, Augsburg is, is, is 2-0. and That's their, their joint top of the table with Hoffenheim. There's your two leaders right now. Hoffenheim I mean, and Augsburg. And, uh, the team that I'm looking at, they maybe I don't think they're going to make it to the Europa League, but they could be pushing toward that top. They could be one of those storylines to watch. The newly promoted Armenia uh, Bielefeld. Mm-hmm. This is a team that won the Bundesliga too, which is they a big a champ- accomplishment. Yeah. Right. Um, they dominated the league. They've come out. They've played very well. They got four points in two games. They've looked very organized. I mean, they deserve a ton of credit for how well that they played. Um, so going to be very, very interesting to see how that all plays out as well. Yeah, it's going to be, this is one of my favorite leagues because I mean, the, the play is, is exciting. The, the teams all play a certain way and they go out and they go after each other. Um, there's a lot of equilibrium in the, in the, uh, in the quality of the teams, the gap between the best and the worst is, is, is small. Maybe if you separate Bayern, you take Bayern and you, take them out of the pot and you look at the next 17 teams, the difference between the best and the worst, I think it's a smaller gap than in most leagues. Yeah. Including the premier league. Including the the prim- think, There's a big gap in the premier, premier league. league. We just talked yeah. about Fulham. You, you're going to compare Fulham to Liverpool or Fulham to, to Manchester city or our, even Arsenal. That's a huge gap. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Let's, right. let's pause for a minute, Leo, and let's give a shout out to our sponsor BTV. Tell us yeah, a little bit about them. Better than Vegas, a brilliant concept from a good dude. Um, basically, what it is, you got a bunch of different handicappers coming on. They give you a bunch of, um, they give you their information, they give you their picks. They have the handicapping showdown. Your boys already won it three times. I don't know why you guys bother going to their site. Just go to djsunited.com, baby. But better than Vegas, <laughs> a ton of really good information. You do see my pretty face on there all the time. Um, they're they're slowly growing and they're getting better. Um, they're bringing in a bunch of new content. It was a really, really good stuff. Anybody that likes the wager, highly recommend checking it out. Everything on their website is completely free. And again, it's a good dude. I always feel, I always have a warm, fuzzy feeling whenever we, uh, whenever we can support good people doing good stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely go check it out. Better than dot Vegas, not dot com dot Vegas. And it is better than Vegas. Get better. All right. Leo, this is your segment. We are going to Greece. Tell us what went down this weekend in Super League. All right, Super League. Uh, we're going to start off on Saturday. The stunning, uh, stunning result of the weekend was Pauk going to Volus. It finishes nil-nil. Stunning turn of events there. Uh, then you have Olympiakos coming, uh, sandwiching the game in the Premier League between their qualification for the Champions League. They end up winning the game 2 nothing. Stunning turn of events. It takes two second-half goals, including another shady miss call on the second goal for Cafu. No surprise there. But Olympiacos win 2-0. Uh, they've won both of their games so far. They have a goal differential of 5-0. Five, uh, five and then you have another really surprising uh, result with Aris Tain Yanana 2-2. Then you have Ofi and Atromito 2-2 as well. Ike dominate their matchup against uh, Lamia 3-0. And then Panathi Meako dominate the entire game against Larissa on the road. Up 1-0. They get an early goal from Macheda. Next thing you know, uh, they let up a stupid goal where our defenders fall asleep in the 87th minute. Game finishes 1-1. Panathi Meako, very bad start to the year. One point through our first two games against weak teams. Um, does not look promising. Yeah, I, I was following, you know, the score lines this weekend, and I did, I did notice that. I do see Ari is still top of the table for another week. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Ari, very interesting team. Uh, it's really good to see them playing as well as they are, just because them and Falk, they have the big Thessaloniki mm-hmm. Derby. Of course. Um, it, it's just, it's one of the great rivalries that very few people know about, very few people talk about. Um, Feftat Zidis, he's been an absolute star for them. He, he's been on the national team for many years, but now he's going on to Addis. He scored a goal the other day. He looks great. Um, 
at the top of the table, though, we all know who it's going to be. It's going to be Olympia Costa. It's going to be Ike. It's going to be Palk. And, you know, maybe Aris is playing for fourth. Hopefully, Panathinaiko can come in and we can get uh, qualified for Champions League again because we miss it. Mm -hmm. But very, very interesting times in the Greek League right now. Definitely, definitely. And, again, the Greek League works with a different format. It's similar to the Scottish League in that you got 14 teams. The top six at the halfway point, right? They play each other twice, and then they split the top six, go into a championship round, while the bottom eight go into a relegation round. So those those places there between five, six, seven, eight, those can be that can be an exciting race there, because one, if you get into that sixth spot, you can fight for a Europa League spot. Where do how many Europa League spots do you have in Greece? Two, two. So you got third and fourth. Yes. Okay. So, you know, you, you should be right there. And you get that sixth place spot. You know you can't finish any lower than sixth. Mm-hmm. You know you're not going to be relegated. So that is a huge relief for a lot of teams at the midway point of the season. You fall to seventh and you can go on a 10-game losing streak and find yourself fighting off relegation. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely an interesting format. Not exactly my favorite format, mm-hmm. but because of the amount of teams that we have in it, um, we don't really have a choice as to how we're going to format it. So it kind of is what it is. It's yeah, it's very fun that to watch you play 26 the games, which is not enough. And right. um, this gives you bigger, you know, more big games too. Mm-hmm. You get well, to yeah, see the big teams see each other match. more. Yeah. Which is, you know, that is the, basically the fire that football's built on is, is local derbies and, and rivalry matches. So matches between big clubs. So I, I do like this format. Like I said, Scotland has used it in the past basically to create more old firms because that's the only time anyone pays any attention to Scotland <laughs> is when Celtic play Rangers and you get them four times a year instead of two. All right. So anything else with Greece? You want to go over any scorers or anything? I got no, the that, top goal scorers are- here. Those are pretty much the uh, – okay. no, we're going to go over it once by nothing and it gets hot. We'll, we'll dive in a little Sounds bit Sounds good. Sounds good. All right, then let's go to Serie A where we had some, some results last week to talk about. And I'm pulling those up right now, the Italian Serie A I'm talking about. We already talked Brazilian Serie A, now the original, the, the Italian one. And let's go to Saturday's matches. Um, the first match was – it was Saturday, September the 26th. Torino 2, Atalanta 4, Cagliari 0, Lazio 2, Sampdoria 2, Benevento 3, big win for the promoted side. Inter 4, Fiorentina 3, you move to Sunday and you got Spezia 1, Sassuolo 4, Elas Verona 1, Udinese 0, Crotone 0, Milan 2, Napoli 6, Genoa 0, Roma 2, Ronaldo 2. (laughs) <laughs> you uh, took the words out of my mouth, man. <laughs> and it was it was uh, Juventus playing with ten men for quite a while. Um, we'll talk about that one in just a second. Monday's result: Bologna four, Parma one. Uh, the table now after two rounds: Napoli, Atalanta, Inter, Milan, and Hellas Verona all on six points. The five of them. And then you got a whole slew of teams under that. We'll we'll just talk about the five teams that are top of the table right now. Anybody surprise you in those top five? Uh, not necessarily a surprise, but the team that I'm looking – well, I mean, Verona winning their first two games is a yeah. bit of a surprise, but I don't really expect them to be they, uh, much right. of a threat. The ones that I'm looking at, though um, – you know, again, we've talked about Inter, how they're among the few teams that can push Juventus. They may mm-hmm. be the only team that can really push Juventus. The team that I'm looking at, though, and I'm really hoping that they can pull into the top four is AC Milan. I love Milan. Zlatan Ibrahimovic, uh, guy gets COVID. And he just posts a, posts a <laughs> phenomenal tweet. Uh, anybody that hasn't seen it, I highly recommend. I don't yeah. want to do it injustice and read it off to you. Right. You, it, you it's to too great. You have to read it place. yourself. <laughs> oh, that, guy's, that guy's a special kind of dude. But uh, a lot of talent on AC Milan, if they can figure it out defensively and they can mm-hmm. maybe, I don't know, maybe sign another center back, they could be looking good. They do have Donnarumma in net. Um, Donnarumma is one of the best young goalies in the world, but they also Certainly. have a bunch of young talent. Um, they're about a center back or two away from really, really making some noise in the city. Yeah. Catching up to Inter there. And um, mm-hmm. So you got Napoli and Atalanta also up there. Napoli plus eight goal difference. Of course, they had a six-nil victory this week. Um, 
you impressed at all with Napoli? Their next one is a big one. It's going to be Sunday. They're traveling to the Juventus Arena to take on Juventus. Another tough game for the champions. No, no, I'm not. I'm, I don't consider Napoli to be a threat. I mean, this team just – there's something about them that they're lacking. They're lacking a little something. And really, if, for me, it kind of feels like they're missing a real striker. Uh, for years, they've had Milicic, they had Higuain. It's like they, they just purposely go out and find those suck bag strikers and just put them out there. And they're like, yeah, these guys are great. When in reality, they can't score on an empty net. Um, so, I mean, I feel like they're missing a striker. Mertens is definitely older now. And Senia is older now. Uh, Chucky Lozano is perfectly fine. They don't have a great defensive midfield. Uh, they started Zelensky and Ruiz the other day. They, in the midf- uh, They're back four. You got the two center backs. You got Manolas, who's definitely older now. He's lost a step. He's not as good as he used to be. And then you have uh, Kulabai. We're waiting to see. He's another guy that we're looking at and saying, I wonder if he's leaving this week. So we'll see if he's there this week. If not, you know, that's a huge blow for Napoli, and it's pretty much over for him. And in the match of the week last week, I said we'd talk about it in a second, and here we go. It's Roma 2 and Juventus 2 at the Olimpico. And uh, the 11 for Juventus, Chesney in goal. You had Danilo, Bonucci, and Chiellini in the back. A three-man back line again uh, for Pirlo. And four-man midfield. He had – Kuvalevsky had moved to midfield. We had seen him play uh, – we'd seen him play up top next to Cristiano Ronaldo in the first match, and now they moved him into a wide midfield role. A center, ba- a center mid pairing of Adrian Rabio and Weston McKinney with Juan Cuadrado running down the left. Aaron Ramsey playing in a true number 10 role behind Alvaro Morata and Cristiano Ronaldo. While Roma come out with Mirante in goal, they also go with the same exact formation. Uh, sorry, not the same exact formation, but the same type of defense. A three-man back line, Gianluca Mancini, Roger Ibanez, and Maraj Kumbula are the three in the back. In midfield, David Santan, Jordan uh, Veretto, Lorenzo Pellegrini, and Leonardo Spinazzola. Uh, sit in behind Pedro Rodriguez, Henrik Mkhitaryan, and Edin Dzeko. Dzeko. That is a good front three there for Roma. But Roma's going to be disappointed with this result. I mean, they had their first match forfeited due to the, uh, you know, an unconceivable, unforgivable error of not registering a player and then playing and putting him into the match. How, how that even happens. How that even happens at this level is, is unheard of. <laughs> But so, and they didn't win that match anyway, but they dropped the point they did get. And then they're minutes from, win, from winning this one against the champions and it ends up getting taken from them. A Douglas Costa uh, cross right onto the head of Cristiano Ronaldo. And I don't know how the guy stays in the air that long. They show this replay and he's up there waiting for the ball to come. The defender jumps with him and has already landed by the time that the ball arrives at, at his head. Yeah, I mean, he's a... He's Cristiano Ronaldo. I mean, that's pretty much it, man. There's a reason why we talk about him. Um, he's incredible in the air. And like you said, it's it's ridiculous to watch. It's the one thing that he's had over Messi for years is Ariel Perales. Mm-hmm. Um, really interesting setup, though, from Juventus. I mean, you look yeah. at the setup, and it's you basically got the back three. We talked about Danilo Bonucci, Chiellini. And then what should have been wing backs, you have Juan Cuadrado, who's – essentially always been a attacking midfielder, attacking winger. Mm-hmm. Um, I know he's kind of grown into the right back role and, but I mean, he is an attack minded uh, player. Yeah, and then you have, um, I'm going to mess up his name. Help me Dejan Kuvalevsky. There we go. And then you got him playing. Kulusevsky, as sorry. Kulusevsky. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, very, very interesting lineup there from Juventus. I don't know how, if they plan on going with this lineup moving forward, I don't know how well it's going to work out. Because I feel like you're going to have guys like Yalini Bonucci going to be exposed, especially Danilo on the other side. I remember Danilo very well. Um, wouldn't shock me at all to see him being exposed either. So uh, kind of curious. Kind of curious you, lineup for you me. You got a lot of guys not playing right now for, for Juventus also. You got, you got Paulo Dybala coming, working his way back from an injury. Federico Bernardeschi is injured. Alexandro is injured. Matias Delict is injured. <laughs> There's, uh, so that defense can get better. I think this this setup was kind of a makeshift for what they had available for this match. Um, yeah. I think you'll see a stronger defense when those guys get back. But you look down their their bench also. De Siglio, 
you got uh, Pinsolio, you got Gianluca Frabota, who made a, a short five-minute appearance. Rodrigo Betancourt came on in the 68th, Douglas Costa in the 58th. Arthur comes on in the 58th. They have a lot of, they have a lot of depth, but it, it just wasn't clicking in this match. Um, they, they do have too much of an attendant, uh, too much of a tendency, I think, to sit back and, and look for Ronaldo to save them when things aren't going well. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Um, and they have they have players to not have to do that. It's going to be interesting to see if that's sustainable again this year because it was yeah. last year, um, yeah. but it was very very close last year. Now you have teams in Italy that are starting to get better. That are starting oh, they're getting to- closer. That gap's oh. getting closer, in my opinion. Yeah, so I mean, going to be super interesting to see how it all plays out in Italy this year. Yeah, and then once you factor in Champions League matches at the midweek, he's not going to be able to to play every single match. They need to have they need to find another way to to get goals. Right. All right. So also looking here in in Italy, um, one of the other stories is we talked about Roma. We talked ab- about um, Juventus in Hellas, Verona, Milan, Inter. All right, Lazio, they were title contenders last year. They've started off with a win and a loss. And um, we'll see what comes of Lazio. Ciro Immobile is, is a year older. And, you know, they, we'll see. Let's take a look at their roster real quick and see what they're looking like right now as I pull it up here. I mean, the guy I'm still lo- waiting to get transferred out is uh, Milinkovic Savic. He's yeah. been linked pretty much everywhere at some point in his career. Uh, Got to wonder when that's officially going to pull the trigger. Um, I feel like he's kind of sort of the engine that makes that team go. Mm-hmm. They also have Correa up top. Uh, Correa, very good player. Not not great. And then you have Immobile. Is anybody going to want to come in and swoop up, grab him? I don't know. It kind of seems I, like he's destined to stay at Lazio. I, I agree. I was going to say he's kind of like – he looks like their, their Totti or their, uh, mm-hmm. you know, their, their guy that kind of just stays for a while. We're looking at their their match this week. They lost 4-1 at home to Atalanta. All right. And uh, Felipe Quesedo has their goal. But, yeah, you're looking at this team. They're playing a 3-5-2 formation. And, I mean, they get lit up by Alejandro Gomez and uh, Hans Hattabar and Robin Gossens, all with goals for Atalanta. And this was a team that was really contending right to the end last season. Um and like we said, you know, Immobile had – he ended up with the golden boot last year for European leagues, passing uh, Lewandowski on the last day of the season. And uh, that was before Lewandowski proceeded to score like four goals in the Champions League. Yeah, no. no. <laughs> he he doesn't get but, any type of golden boot. No, you, you not at all. We, we have to cancel the golden boot because we can't give it to Robert Lewandowski. Um, <sighs> we'll see. I mean, I, this league definitely needs a few more weeks for some storylines to start to play out for some teams to start to separate. But I'm looking forward to that Napoli and Juventus match this weekend. Yeah, I mean, it should be interesting to watch. I still like Juve in the matchup. I just don't I don't see enough talent on the field for Napoli. And we kind of talked about it again. When you have these players that they don't know if they're coming, they don't know if they're going, how do they react afterwards? Are they going to be happy? Are they going to be mad? Mm-hmm. Um, do they have people chirping in their ear? Kind of one of those things that you got to just wait and see. So let's let's uh, move a little bit more to the present. The last two days, we had Champions League action. We had qualifiers. So we now know the teams that are going to be in the Champions League this year. We have all 32 teams selected. Let's take a look and see what went down this week. We didn't get a chance to talk about last week's game because we didn't have a show on Sunday. It's a special Wednesday night edition, everybody. <laughs> yeah, baby. And this part of the show, Leo, is brought to us by our – Good friends are our friends who sponsors the the Sunday night sports book, betonline.ag. And uh, tell the, the viewers and the listeners a little bit about betonline.ag while I pull up uh, the so results. Betonline.ag, they've been one of the oldest books in the industry. They're one of the best rated A plus on the sports book review. Um, quick payouts, quick turnarounds. One of the few books that actually do payouts on the weekend. Highly recommend checking out betonline.ag. We find all of our lines from there as well. Um, They're another really reliable book. And when you're going offshore, that's all you can really hope for. Somebody that you know is going to pay out, that's going to pay out quickly, that's not going to give you a problem. Uh, Especially now that five times is canceled out, it is time to take a look at betonline.ag, one of the best in the industry. 
All right. So we'll, we'll go back to last week and look at the first legs first. So we have context for yesterday and today's matches. So starting on Tuesday, 22nd of September, Krasnodar 2, Pauk 1, Maccabi Tel Aviv 1, Red Bull Salzburg 2, Slavia Prague nil. Majit, is it Majitlan? Is that how you pronounce that in the uh, Danish style? I, I have no idea. Is that good enough for you? That's <laughs> close enough. The Danish the, side. There's Majit, only one of them. All right, guys? Uh, nil. That that one ended nil nil in the first leg. And then Wednesday you had Gant one, Dinamo Kiev two, Molde three, Ferenc Karavos three, Olympiakos two. And you can pronounce that that ship uh, Cyprian team for me. Omnia Nicosia uh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Omonia. Omonia. Uh, Nicosia. Nicosia. Yeah. All right. So we, that brings us to yesterday, and Dinamo Kiev will close out that round. 3 0 winners at home in the Ukraine over Ghent. Ferenc Karros with another with a nil nil draw. They advance on away goals, having drawn 3 3 away and nil nil at home. They're going into the Champions League group stage. And then um, Omonia. Omonia Nicosia nil Olympiakos nil, and then we have today's matches: Midland four, Slavia Prague one, Pauk one, Krasnodar two. Krasnodar win four two. That one surprised me a bit. I think it surprised you as well that Krasnodar put out Pauk. I expected more out of Pauk, given that I thought I saw a pretty good um, effort and a pretty good performance from them in the previous round. And first round, uh, the first game against Krasnodar. Honestly, they deserve to win the game. Yeah, I thought so too. Ridiculous penalty that Krenzador ended up getting. And then um, today, they just came out. It's obvious that they're missing the fans. This is a whole new competition without the fans. Um, of course. The Tumba just wasn't rocking me. The, they got a big goal out of El Kaduri um, in the 77th minute. And then a minute later, Krenzador yeah, comes out. They, it was they the, stick the dagger in it. It was good night. That's about the worst possible way to, to go out in this match is to get draw level. No, you have 13 minutes to... To win, or at least to force extra time in this case, and you know the goal goalkeeper Zivkovic even makes a, a save on the initial shot, parries it off of the post, but then nobody's tracking. Everyone's standing still with their arms up, looking for offside. There's no offside, and and uh, the Russian brutal. team books their ticket into the group stage. And Salzburg three, Maccabi Tel Aviv one today. So the uh, side managed by by our former New York Red Bulls manager Jesse Marsh is on their way to the group stage as well. So that is the Champions League. Anything you want to say about Champions League qualifiers? No, I'm just glad the Champions League's finally coming back. I mean, it's it's a beautiful thing. I missed it. Um, you know, it's always fun to watch. It's always, always something to get excited about on a Tuesday, Wednesday afternoon when we were sick of working. Um, <laughs> uh, but, yeah, it's it's good stuff. So very excited. It's all quality teams in there again this year. So. Should be interesting to see how everything plays out, how the draw is going to come out, and uh, what's going to happen from there. All right, I'm going to quickly pivot back to South America here. We are in match day four of the Copa Libertadores. Uh, some matches played yesterday, some underway already today. I'll just quickly run those down. Yesterday in Uruguay, Peñarol 3, Colo Colo 0. In, in Brazil, Grêmio 2, Universidad Católica 0. Uh, Colombian side, America de Cali 0. Inter Porto Alegre, Brazil, nil. Brazilian side, Athletic Paranaense, nil. Bolivian Jorge Wilsterman, nil. Uh, Argentine, Ju- uh, Argentine Giants, Boca Juniors, nil, nil against the Paraguayan side, Libertad. And Ecuador's Liga de Quito, four. Um, B Nacional, nil. And then the matches played so far today, Caracas of Venezuela, nil. Independiente Medellin of Colombia, two. Nacional de Montevideo, one. Racing Club of Argentina, two. In Brazil, you got Palmeiras, five. And Bolivar, nil. The rest of the matches just kicked off, and I just got an alert. Flamengo are up one nil over Independiente del Valle. And you got Alianza Lima taking on Estudiantes de Mérida. Junior Barranquilla is taking on Barcelona Guayanquil. And River Plate is taking on São Paulo. Three games tomorrow in Copa Libertadores to close out match day four. Olympia of Paraguay take on Santos of Brazil. Argentine side Tigre take on Guarani of, I want to say, Peru. And Delphine take on Defensa E. 
Justicia. And that will wrap up match day four in the Copa Libertadores. I'll quickly run through the tables in Group A. Right now, Flamengo are top of the table with 12 points, but that's only because they're in action right now. So they may not have 12 points when the day is done. Um, Independiente del Valle are right behind them. Junior Barranquilla third with seven points. And Barcelona Guayanquil right now with one point. Group B, Palmeiras, 13 points. They're through to the next round. Guarani are se- second on seven. Bolivar, third on four. And Tigre have won Group C. Atletic Paranaense, 10 points. Jorge Wilsterman, seven. Peñarol, six. And Colo Colo, six. Group D, uh, Liga de Quito, 12 points. River Plate, last year's finalist and winners the year before. They have eight there in second. Sao Paulo, third with five. And B Nacional bringing up the rear in uh, fourth place with three points. Group E, Grêmio. The two city rivals, Grêmio, are top with 10. Their, their crosstown rivals, Inter, have eight. America de Cali have five. And Universidad Católica with four. Group F, you got Hassing and Nacional de Montevideo, each with 12 points. Estudiantes Merida have three as do Alian Salima. Group uh, G, Santos with 10. Defensa y Justicia with six. Olimpia with five. And Delfin with one. Flamengo have just scored again, according to my alert. We got another goal. So it's Flamengo two now. Independiente del Valle, nil. Group H, Boca Juniors are top. They have 11 points. The Venezuelan side, Caracas are surprising everybody right now in second place with seven points. Venezuelan sides do not normally advance out of the group stage. Libertad, a third with seven points. And Independiente, Medellin from Colombia are in fourth place with three points. All right, Leo, do you want to run down any MLS scores before we call it a night? Nah, man, we'll catch up on that. They got a a ways to go. That sounds good. All right, guys, thank you for joining us on this very special Wednesday night edition of Parking the Bus. And uh, we will be back at our normal time Sunday, right, Leo? Ah, that's the game plan. (laughs) We've had the same game plan every week. And yeah, sometimes sometimes circumstances beyond our control take over. And Uh, uh, that's right. We can't always get it out on time. But we we plan to be live on on Sunday night. Okay. Uh, So. Make sure you go down there, guys. Hit subscribe. Hit alert so that you'll know when we go live on Sunday. All right, for the sun for the normal Sunday night edition of Parking the Bus. But this has been episode 14. Leo, uh, anything you want to plug before you before we say peace? Yeah. Um DJsunited.com, guys. Go ahead, go check out everything. Roland Garros, we're in the middle of uh, the French Open right now. Another successful start to the tournament. Um, we have all the soccer going on. We already just broke it down for the last hour, so you guys know to check that out. We have daily fantasy lineups coming out for the EPL during the weekend, uh, during the weekends and stuff. Also, NFL free daily fantasy lineups as well. Free picks for every sport every single day. All you got to do, go to our website, dgensunited.com. Check everything out right there. We will be golden, everybody. All right, and since you mentioned it, fantasy, uh, the plan is to have a PTB, Daily Fantasy Champions League thing going right Lil? yes yes we're gonna try to set that up by the time champions league gets started um once that stuff gets going you know maybe we'll progress over to the epl weekends and stuff maybe you guys can try to beat me good luck but yeah we'll, yeah, we'll gauge based on what kind of interest there is out there yep all right and i'm just gonna quickly plug to go back check out my my UFC review show. I put it out early this morning. All right. Breaking down the main card from last Saturday night's UFC 253. Leo and I did the preview to it earlier on Saturday. That was our most watched video to date. Thank you everybody that, that checked it out. Um, it was, it, it's really, uh, it's an honor that to, to, to have people actually take listen to us <laughs> talk about, about mixed martial arts and about football as well. And, um, you know, it, we do this, it gives us strength to keep doing this because, uh, you know, we get together a couple times a week now and talk and we, we record these shows. I know you, you got your daily show going, you got your own videos going on, on better than Vegas. And I've got Mr. Benfica going. I've got Flamingo nation in hiatus that I'm trying to bring out of hiatus. I got to catch up <laughs> there, but it, it, it is a whirlwind. Plus we all have, we both have day jobs, which uh, don't leave us alone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and- <laughs> 
<laughs> They're number one priority, guys. Make yeah. sure you guys pay your tolls, please. And, yes, exactly. And, and if you don't, stop calling the customer service centers, please. Uh, to anyone who got a voicemail from me that sounded something like this, unfortunately, I cannot, uh, I cannot adjust your balance. You, if you would like to dispute this, you'll have to do so by way of sending a formal appeal to the Department of Transportation. You can find that appeal on our website at www. You fill in the blank. I'm not going to say the website here, but I apologize, boy, but I can't, do, I can't make your, your bill go away. Pay it. That's my parting words this week. Pay your bills, people. Pay your bills, you bumps. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, everybody. I am the Mr. Mike Augustine. I am signing off for Leo Kukakis. Have a great week, and we'll see you Sunday on Parking the Bus. Later, folks. Peace out.